for having us here, feeding us. Um, that's very nice. Uh, first talk for me actually in Singapore. Um, yeah, that's better now. Uh, so I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a data scientist at a company called Data IQ. Um, just uh, because I, I really want to understand a bit uh, your interest, could you raise your hand if you're a data scientist? Okay. Um, could you raise your hand if you're more a, a manager interested in data? Okay, wow, uh, quite a fair number. And if uh, some people did not raise hands, so uh, are you more business analysts or data engineers? Yeah, okay. I guess we have a majority here. Um, so just a disclaimer, uh, it's a quite technical talk that has some um, business value, so those business people should be happy, um, has some uh, technical details on computer vision. So computer vision is, is a very old, old-fashioned term. Sorry about that, but it's actually still a thing today. But don't worry, we'll also talk about the new thing, uh, brave new world of AI. Um, so, ha among you, how many uh, have heard about the company Data IQ? Okay, okay, a, f a, f a few hands. Uh, so, I'll just take three minutes just to introduce us and why we are speaking to you tonight. Um, we are a software company. We want, we've been trying to solve these four issues for the past six years. Um, first one is that there's not that many data scientists. I could see that <laughs> in the room tonight. Um, so we are trying uh, to make data scientists more productive. Second one is that um, the, the most important activity uh, is data preparation, which is quite, as a data scientist, I find it rather tedious, but you cannot uh, do without it, but you can be faster at it. Um, third one is that if you work with data, you know there's, there's a lot of cool technologies, but all these cool technologies are made by open source researchers. They all have different goals. Combining them together can be a challenge. So our platform is based on different open source technologies I'll just name drop a few, scikit-learn, Hadoop, things like that. And we uh, want to make it simpler for all of them to work together. And the last one, which is nowadays six years later down the road, our main focus is getting all these model, these nice Jupyter notebooks, um, not just a nice Kaggle leaderboard, but making them into the production system of companies. And we are talking about companies with quite uh, established, read ancient uh, production systems. Uh, so how do you integrate the brave new world of AI with the world of production? Uh, just you may wonder, what does data IQ mean? So it's, it's a French company, by the way. So <laughs> uh, for some reason, French people are really fan of Japanese culture. Uh, these are a few metrics about us. Um, yeah, I, I joined around 50 people. We're almost 200 now. Uh, we're still hiring if you're interested. You can s speak to me after this. Um, and tonight, I'd like to talk to you about a practical use case that we have worked about uh, upon using our software. There is actually, I, I'm going to stop the advertising right, right there. There is nothing specific about data IQ. Um, from this slide onwards. Uh, We're going to talk about a universal problem uh, for mail processing. Um, so some of you, if, have you worked with, uh, with mail processing or OCR before? Okay, 
One, one of you. OK, so some of you might say it's actually a solved problem. Uh, there are all sort of OCR systems to scan letters, etc. Um, there's been research and there's been production systems on this since uh, the 50s. Um, but uh, it started with pretty specific, simple use cases, like I want to recognize the postcode, or I want to recognize the number on a bank check on a specific um, square that is identified within the check. Um, and maybe you're going to tell me, oh, I have the, the iPad Pro, or maybe I have the Palm, the Palm Pilot. And the Palm Pilot had um, optical character recognition. I could uh, have my pen on the Palm, and I mean, it's, I think the Palm Pilot is like 25 year old. I didn't have this, my dad had it. Um, and you could write down um, with your pen, and it would recognize the letter. But actually, these are um, pretty defined, smaller um, cases of um, character recognition. Um, because you're taking assumptions like the, um, the fonts are this way, or it's written only for numbers in this square box, or uh, it's online, so you know what is the separation between the words. Um, if you want to do general mail processing, so like letters, anything, it's still an ongoing uh, research case. Uh, so we tried to have a shot at it. Um, this is what <laughs> the kind of before after analogy. Um, this is very real. Uh, and this is very much today, even though it's a black and white movie. Um, this is what it looks like. You, re you receive a company, receives hundreds, thousands of letters uh, every month and has to triage them to get them to the correct service. Because people, when you write to a company, you don't really care, oh, I'm, I'm going to send it to... Um, customer service of this business unit. No, you're, you're just going to write, I want to uh, send it to this company. And the person in charge of the mail triage has to deal with that. Um, this we have made a, uh, a pipeline for actually an insurance company uh, that is pretty recent, 10 years old, 200 uh, employees, and which was receiving a, an actual fair number of letters. So between uh, 800 and 2,000 letters a day. Um, so business value. This cost them uh, 100,000 uh, euros per year because they were outsourcing that to another company whose sole job was to open the letters and determine which business unit of the company to send it to. Was it accounting? Was it marketing? Was it customer service? Uh, and there was humans behind it. Um, so our task was to automate the repetitive task. And as a data scientist, it makes me quite positive about the future of AI. Uh, because in the end of the day, it's really about putting this really tedious work uh, out of people so they can focus on more important things. Oh, I hope your phone's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how are we on time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So um, I'll, I, I will uh, dive, but not too far into different parts of the pipeline. Uh, but essentially, we've had to dealt first with four challenges. First one is how do you differentiate between handwritten and typed letters. Uh, how do you deal specifically with the type one, and then how do you deal with the handwritten ones? Uh, the handwritten, there's even the issue of detecting the words. Um, and then getting from the scan, so images, to the actual words in our alphabet, so symbols. Um, what did the raw data look like? <laughs> um, so that was the data that was promised. Uh, a rather clean mix of identified type letters and handwritten letters. But actually, 
this is us <laughs> before we receive a promise data. Um, this is the real data that we received. Acre was not such a clean mix. There was a lot of things in between the handwritten and the typed one. It's because the outsourced company, they had no stakes in the process. They were just paid to, to do that. So they would receive a letter and they would scan literally everything. If they received a 100 page leaflet, they would scan all of it. They would even scan the envelope. Uh, so we needed to separate all these documents first. Uh, so we build a web app. You can build web apps in our product um, for the purpose of labeling that. So we actually <laughs> labeled that ourselves. And then uh, we did a, a pretty old deep learning technique called autoencoder. So if you know what autoencoder is, Okay, um, so very simply, if, if you know a bit the theory about neural networks, um, the, the trick is that the input of a network is the image itself, so RGB here, and then the layers uh, narrow down. And then you try to reconstruct the image. So essentially a uh, autoencoder is a compression mechanism. It's exactly that. And if you take the middle layer, this is a, what we call a latent space representation. So you go from an RGB, uh, so three layers times the size of the image. So you go from uh, a million of dimension to a much smaller latent space, which is a good representation of the image. So that's what we call by compression. Uh, so here are examples of what it looks like. This is the real image. Um, and then it's the decoded version. So there is encoded and decoded. So you see that the decoded one uh, is quite blurry. It's because it has less information. Um, but it's good because thanks to this reduction, uh, you can go from a million dimensions to a, a few hundreds. And you can use this dimension to train a traditional machine learning approach uh, based on these dimensions. Uh, so here you have uh, the confusion matrix. So this is the way you assess the quality of your algorithms uh, for uh, Tabiscript, uh, so uh, something uh, that is typed, uh, manuscript or other. Other is like an envelope or something that we don't want to deal with. Um, then, how, do you, how did we deal with the type case? The type case, uh, this one, uh, thanks to all the research that has been going uh, since the 50s, this one is pretty much a solved case or at least 90% solved. Uh, there's something cool that's used by superheroes and by data scientists called Tesseract. Um, and Tesseract is literally three lines of code. Um, there's a, a team from HP, which uh, is now handled uh, by Google, which maintains this, uh, this Tesseract library, which you can use from Python. And apologies, because that's very French. But if you did read French, you would be able to tell that it's actually a almost perfect uh, extraction. Uh, the only thing that didn't work too well was the signature to this, because the signature is handwritten. Um, and very quickly, the quality of the classification for type letter is very, very good, just based on this Tesseract three lines of code. But now uh, let's speak about a harder uh, problem. Um, so actually the research community uh, had, because it was harder and because they are very proud of what they did, uh, they don't call that optical character recognition, they call that intelligent character recognition, so ICR. Um, uh, 
And so we used, um, again, it's, it's things that exist in the research. We didn't invent an approach, we just adapted to our problem. Um, first of all, boxes with traditional computer vision methods. Traditional computer vision methods are still very much working and important today. Uh, and then, from these boxes, we applied new deep learning methods. So, computer vision. Who has heard about computer vision? Okay. So, uh, I hope that doesn't lose <laughs> you too much. I'd be happy to take questions. I, I will stay after this. But um, a couple of techniques we used, something called a cross-dilatation kernel um, to extract the paragraphs. Um, then, to detect the words, uh, we use the same convolution to look at the vertical density. So as you can see here, uh, if you look at the pixel density, so we, we went uh, from RGB to black and white, because at this stage, it, it's mostly about contrast, and you can see that, boom, 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 uh, you have uh, a density that drops between words. So we use that to separate words. And uh, we had a lot of tweaking to do, but it, it, uh, we managed to get it working. Um, now, what about, I promised some AI, so what about the real deep learning here? Uh, so we used a combination of the two best cell, uh, types of layers which are commonly used in deep learning, called a convolution and a, a long, uh, short-term memory. So uh, a recurring, recurrent neural networks with convolutional ones. So uh, convolution, CNNs, are traditionally used for image processing, and um, LSTM are traditionally used for natural language. So it's pretty natural that in order to get from an image to a, uh, a word, you combine the two. So uh, from the input image, you extract features using a CNN, you reshape, and then you have a lot of LSTMs which gets, uh, so the output layer is, is a, uh, a word. Uh, we use uh, Keras and TensorFlow, uh, which are integrated into uh, our platform in order to deploy uh, that architecture, which is pretty deep. Um, I'm just dropping it here. Uh, there is a very hard issue with this problem. It's because, uh, pretty simple, some people do A like this. Some people do A like this. But the CNN is handling uh, the problem in blocks of fixed size. So CTC is a way that you get these blocks of 10 pixels down to a world, to uh, one world. Uh, so it collapses um, the APPLE to AA, etc to one uh, given world. And it's, it's really smart. If, if you want to read one paper on this, um, this one is a really great read. Um, we, had to, we didn't have enough training data, so we combined a lot of different sources, um, which was a bit of a challenge. And we applied a, an interesting trick called curriculum learning, where we first learned the network uh, words of four, then five words, then six words, etc. If you throw your networks directly uh, words of 10 letters, it won't really work. That's why you get a kind of like, oh, I'm, this is like, I'm learning the four words, and then like five, oh, five is hard, and then getting better, so you have this uh, scissor shape, and you're converging then to a network that kind of understands uh, words. So it, in the end, we, it was a lot of work, but just to get you uh, an idea of uh, where we got, um, out of 100 letters, we were able, so we, we put the envelope, et cetera, out of scope. Uh, out of the, both the typed and the handwritten, sorry, uh, handwritten and typed, we managed to correctly say 
we know about 78% uh, of them. And out of these 78% where we said, OK, we are sure about what we are saying, we were able to correctly classify 90% of the cases. So in 90% of the cases, we could say, this letter should be sent to customer service or to uh, marketing. Here you go. Um, some concluding remarks. It was a, a tough but really fun project uh, that we put in production. Uh, actually, I, sh I should say it on my slide. Uh, we deployed it pretty recently at our client. So they will start to be able to uh, compare it with their human process, etc. Uh, there's a lot of technical uh, gritty details that we didn't talk about. Um, and I hope that this will generate some natural byproducts which are more interesting, like natural language processing, uh, etc. Um, yeah, just a quick, uh, if you have an interesting project like this, drop us a line. We have a team of data scientists which are, are interesting into looking at deep, compelling, and risky use cases like this. Um, thanks. Um, and we have, I think, a few minutes for questions. Um, so it was uh, actually um, it was actually lower, um, but because there is this twenty percent where we are not sure, so we still ask them to have a look at it. So uh, we'll be able to really compare once um, they have it for a few months in production side by side. Uh, but for the ones where we are sure. 90% uh, is slightly, uh, is a few percent higher compared to what their team had. Um, for these types of problems or use cases, um, what's your view on like how often should you do a, a frequent a feedback and to train the model after you deploy the production? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, in my opinion, as often as uh, possible. Um, but the real issue is how do you get uh, labels to get that feedback. Yes. But uh, at least on a weekly basis, or ideally daily, uh, if, you can get a, if you can build a, a software like a web app to get that feedback f uh, back to the model. Uh, can you tell me how the accuracy for your ICRR handwriting like the comparison handwriting the Samsung because for instance I I write on my Samsung mobile phone. So yeah. your ICR can detect the handwriting like that. What's the type accuracy? Which one is higher? Um okay, I think I have it here. Um so the accuracy of the manuscript is, uh, is actually lower than uh, the type if you do the, the maths here. Uh, and the, the real issue is that there's a, a few cases where we, we are not able uh, to, uh, like we don't have a high confidence in our models. So we use ranges. So when we have a strong s score, like we're going to say, you can bypass the human, but Otherwise, we say we still need a human envelope. But um, these numbers are for the the, another problem. Uh, it's for the problem of uh, triage of letters. So it's not about the problem of detecting correctly the letter. Um, detecting correctly the letter is actually pretty simple. So you can very, nowadays, the systems are at 99 or something like that accuracy. Um, but here, uh, there is room for interpretation. 
because uh, sometimes even the, the letter, even if you extract the words correctly, it's not very clear that you, could, you should send it to accounting or marketing. There could be some blurry lines. Any more questions? We can take them. So, so for this model itself, so for this model itself, uh, how long do you have to retrain? Um, for one go, uh, it depends on which uh, which layer. Uh, normally, when uh, you uh, you train it for the first time, uh, you train all the layers. Uh, but then there are some layers that you can freeze and only retrain uh, the last ones. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, the full the full pipeline was taking uh, maybe a day to train something like that. Sorry. But uh, what I meant is that how long you have to I mean how how long in terms of the period of the time. They need to retrain the model, refresh the model again. Oh, um, today I think we uh, we are trying to do that on a monthly basis. Um, now, now the project is at testing phase, so we have tried it once. We want to see if it uh, if if it uh, works. If you compare side by side, and after that uh, we'll have a go no go or uh, on the frequency of the retraining. Ideally, um, on a daily basis, is uh, should be the best uh, the best thing, because uh, anyway, the triage process is the way we get the labels, uh, and there is also some cases where uh, um, people mistake. So the outsourcing company they send it to the wrong department, but then they have to correct it. So that's when you get the true label. So there is a, a, a time component due to the human process on how, when you get the true label. Okay. One last question. Yeah. One more. For this, uh, for this project, uh, did you use a uh, like, uh, data augmentation technique? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. We used, um, uh, indeed, uh, we used uh, many uh, data augmentation techniques. I have a few, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we used, uh, sp like, uh, I dropped the names here. But uh, we didn't have enough date training data to start with, so we had to do a, a lot, actually. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think that's the end of our talk. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.